There we go. So I have your permission to record. And on behalf of the South African Transactional Analysis Association, we welcome Keith Judah from New Zealand. Um, and Keith, we're really looking forward to the webinar. Thanks so much for your time. And I would like to hand over to you. Tanakoto, uh, Tanakoto, Tanatato Kato. Um, thank you, Alex, for inviting me, and thank you to all the participants. Um, uh, yes, it's a it's a great pleasure to to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to what uh, what emerges. <laughs> so I have some slides to share, and um, I guess I'll go through some of those. And I'm, um, I'm because this is a relatively small group. I'm more than happy to sort of work with you and to answer questions as we go or to have comments rather than feel that you have to wait till the end so i hope that we can co-create something together um, across these these uh, kilometers <laughs> so now i share the screen uh, so hopefully you will now be seeing have you got the First slide, co-creative TA. Yeah, we can see it. Great, good. So uh, now, why is that not going? Just wanting to. There we go. So no, my Harry, my welcome. Um, and I've I gather there are twelve official languages in South Africa. So I managed to um, find four of them in in my Google Translate. So Olwini, uh, Sowabuna. Hello. Hello. Um, and I guess already you've got um, some sense of my interest in culture and um, um, particularly in, in acknowledging first cultures. And that's been a strong strand in my uh, personal and professional journey. And I, that's something that I bring to co-creative TA. I think it's part of how I got there. Um, so uh, that's partly that representation. If I were doing something more formal, I'd do a more formal uh, mihi of welcome and uh, uh, pepiha, which is sort of telling you my sort of family genealogy and so on. Um, but as we're being a bit informal, I didn't want to do take too much time to do that. But I hope you get the spirit in which um, I'm acknowledging uh, my land. I loved, uh, Sharon, I think you talked about the land is smiling. I, so that really spoke to me. Uh, it was very... A beautiful sentiment. Um, we have this concept in, in Maori culture of uh, turanga, turanga wai wai, which means finding your place to stand. And I think uh, as an immigrant, um, uh, that's been a very important concept to me coming to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and finding my place to stand here. So, um, co creative transactional analysis, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, its influences and roots. Uh, the principles of co-creative TA and then something a little bit about transactions, ego states, scripts and games and we tend to talk about them in that order. I don't know if when you trained in TA before people tend to talk about ego states first, we tend to talk about transactions first for reasons I'll go into and I'll tell you a bit about the book and I'll also acknowledge my partner in crime, uh, Graham Summers. Um, it's true to say that co-creative TA wouldn't exist. Uh, it, it wouldn't be the product of just one of us. It's the product of both of us. And it's always better for the fact that we've, over, the, over many years now, quarter of a century, I think we've known each other, um, uh, talked and played and fought. And, and um, uh, it, it's really a genuine product of, of the two of us. So that's Graham. I wanted to affy him to, you know, to support him in, in here. So he's very much with me in spirit. Um, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher by background. My first degree was in philosophy and theology. So I tend to like to talk about principles and values and, you know, what the basis is of, of, um, of what we do. So when we, um, when we wrote the first article, this is what well, we wrote it in 1998. Um, and it, it was published in the TAJ in 2000, I was very keen to identify the sort of theoretical strands and principles. So the two um, 
identified theoretical strands, the, 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 the two strands that we identified at the time were field theory, which speaks to context um, and the influence of the field. And of course, as you've seen from my beginning, I'm very influenced by the cultural field, the cultural context. Um, I, when I emigrated to New Zealand, one of the first books I read was by an Australian sociologist called Raywin Connell, uh, called Southern Theory, and in which he was advocating the idea that there is different theory in the Southern Hemisphere, and you know, and it was partly a sort of um, challenging the Western theory that's also Northern. And I think we might we might join in some thinking about that. And uh, one of the things she says is that where the ground is different, the form of theorizing is different. And I was really struck by that, that the question is not so much, you know, um, how does countertransference work here, but more uh, what was here first. <laughs> and then we work from there. So that that's my sort of cultural perspective about field theory but field theory was certainly something that influenced both myself and Graham in thinking about um, the broader context of TA and the other um, uh, critic the other strand that we identified was social constructivism the idea that not only do we construe things um, which is I think fairly standard and it's certainly influenced the narrative um, aspect of TA, people like the uh, James and Barbara Allen um, talked about talk about this. Um, but we but were particularly interested in the social aspect of that, that where concepts like gender and so on are socially constructed as well as construct construed from within. And um, since that initial article, I've been very very much seeing um, a third theoretical strand in co-creative TA which is critical theory. Um, so while we didn't identify that as a particular strand in the initial um, article, I think uh, Graham would agree that, that we, that the co-creative TA in a sense represents a, a, a critical appraisal, a critical rereading of TA. So uh, these are some slides. I don't propose necessarily to go through all of these and read them, but just perhaps to share these with you. And of course, these will be, I don't know, will these also go on the, um, the web, Alex? Yeah, um, all, the, all the slides that are shared will be part Great. of the recording. Great, good. Um, I particularly like this, uh, sorry, the last um, quote, which comes from uh, Malcolm Parlett. Uh, well, both of the quotes do, but the last one I think is particularly significant for us. When two people converse or engage with an, one another in some way, something comes into existence which is a product of neither of them exclusively. There is a shared field, a common communicative home, which is mutually constructed. And that really spoke to us in revisioning um, uh, transactional analysis as not just the stimulus response, but the sort of co-creation of the transaction and the relationship. And in fact, I've just finished an article, my latest article on co-creative counselling, which in a sense is an article that simply unpacks that, well not simply, but it unpacks that last quote and identifies something like eight elements of co-creative counselling, which I can perhaps talk about. Um, social constructivism, uh, is um, very just a brief a brief guide to social constructivism, and the way that that informs TA is that we argue that meaning evolves through dialogue, and hence putting transactions before ego states. That we we would argue that ego states are co-created from transactions rather than that ego states pre-exist transactions. Um, that discourse creates systems, which is, in a sense, the same, same perspective. And that therapy is the co-creation in dialogue of new narratives that provide new possibilities. So in a sense, when we're working with people, and we tend to talk about therapy because that was our background field, but I know Graham himself has gone into coaching now, and I think a lot of this can be transferred, and I know um, you're interested in that. That's 
part of your background. Um, so when I say therapy, most of the time I can also think about education and counselling and coaching and so on. But if we think about the idea that when we work with people, we can replay old stories, which if you like is, you know, a game, uh, confirming an old script, or we can develop new narratives. You know, people can see me as the disapproving father, or and we can play that, or we can do something different in therapy, which then they can take outside. And the therapist is a participant observer in this dialogue. We're very much, I've since um, writing with Graham, I've um, come across um, Martha Stark's taxonomy, where she talks about one person, one and a half person, two person psychology. And I'm very persuaded by uh, the, um, the benefit of two person psychology, which is about, you know, intersubjectivity and um, you know, transactional analysis, really. And I've also um, uh, proposed the idea of a two person plus psychology, which takes account of the environment. And uh, that's us being critical <laughs> with each other, because um, we tend to sort of argue and that creates some heat and energy. Um, so as in my um, philosophical way, I said, okay, we've got, we wrote, I think we wrote the article first and then I said, you know, we've got to identify these principles because, you know, that's what philosophers do. And so we had uh, three principles. We have three principles which we've stuck with and, and we've, I've thought over the years of, uh, you know, are there other principles and I've, I haven't come up with any others. And in the spirit of Occam's razor, you know, the fewer the better, the, we've stuck with the three. So one is the principle of weeness, which I think you'll be very familiar with in terms of the, the South African um, much cited uh, concept of Ubuntu, you know, the, the I am because we are, and that is that appears in a number of, of cultures. Um, I've taken this a bit further forward in a recent article on uh, we are as the fundamental life position rather than I'm okay, you're okay. And so I don't know if you've seen this in the TAJ, it's a couple of years ago, so I I elaborated this idea of um, we are is is actually the fundamental life position um, from which we develop I and you and um, in a sense the, that's that's a challenge to say that things it, it, it's the basis of co-creativity if you like it's the ontological basis of co-creativity the other thing the second principle was one of shared responsibility and this came from a number of critiques that we had about traditional TA where we saw either the um, the responsibility all loaded onto the client so the client was responsible for everything whether you know they had a headache or you know whether they were poor or whatever and um, in that very sort of analytic way but also I think sometimes extreme <laughs> extreme forms of gestalt therapy sort of proposed that you know I, I remember one group being challenged because i did my initial training in Gestalt, um, and I said, "Oh, I've got a headache," and and the therapist said, um, how, you, you, "How can you own that more?" And basically got me and others to say, "I am headaching myself," and you know, it's it's kind it it is challenging, and I I can agree with that up to a point, but when taken to an extreme version, it's like that's you're you're absolutely responsible for everything. I think that denies the the impact of the environment and others and so on. It's a bit like I don't know if you when you were trained, you know, people say, "Oh, you can't, um, you can't make a person feel." You have to, you know, I, I'm feeling this, and you think that, and all of that sort of emotional literacy stuff. And I sometimes think you go through training, unlearning the stuff that you say. You make me feel, and you say, "No, okay, I feel when you," and then at the end of training, <laughs> I feel I can say, "Yes, and you do make me feel." <laughs> You know, people can press each other's buttons to the point that you can almost determine how people feel. So, so that was one critique that the client was was blamed for everything. But the other, or, or, or you know, had to account for everything. The other critique was where the therapist was, became the um, solely responsible for the client's healing, and the sort of rather the sort of guru therapist, the the therapist who was so empathic and, and, and the focus was on how wonderful the therapist's empathy was in curing the patient. So we wanted this idea to put on record as it were, or, or, or put forward this idea of 
no, we think that therapy is uh, the, the benefit of therapy and so on is, is, is the product of shared responsibility. Sometimes as a therapist, I might take more responsibility. Sometimes I'll take less. But there's this idea of, you know, shared responsibility um, and that not every, you know, we statement um, is symbiotic. It's, it's also challenging that idea of, of um, sort of inevitable symbiosis or inevitable autonomy. And I, you know, I've been very influenced by persons by being involved in the person centered world and um, uh, in um, ideas of homonymy alongside autonomy. So it's not everything is about, you know, self responsibility and so on. And then the third principle is that of present centered development. And again, this came from a critique of the idea that in order to develop, you have to regress and you have to go into the past that you can actually develop um, in the present and you do, you, do, you do develop in the present. And again, this has led me to other work uh, talking about um, present centeredness as much as person centeredness and the idea of um, it's all sort of linked to the idea of using present verbs rather than you know nouns and I wrote an article once called therapy is a verb which I was quite I was quite interested in the idea of therapy as a noun but it should be a verb so that got my interest there um how, how are you doing so far I sort of feel like I want to check in with you because I'm obviously talking a lot I get, I get thumbs up from the Sharon and Sharon Sorry, can I just ask, what was the yeah. name of the author of the book of taxology? Martha Stark. Uh, Stark. She, it's called um, Modes of Therapeutic Action, in which she basically analyzes therapy, um, not from a sort of historical first force, second force, third force perspective, but more about how people um, relate. And she talks about, you know, one person uh, therapy promoting insight um, two person therapy being about repair and uh, sorry one and a half person therapy being about repair and two person therapy being about relationship and I've added two person plus therapy being about the relationship also including the environment Thanks. so with our critique um, I'll, I think what I'll do perhaps next is just take you through the four fundamental pillars of TA or pillows as some people I, I was teaching recently in Croatia and somebody misheard me and said are you talking about pillows and I said no pillars pillars of TA you know ego states games and so on and but I actually quite like pillows I like the softness of the pillow so th these are the four fundamental pillars or pillows of TA um, from a co-creative perspective so in looking at transactions we wanted to move from uh, the traditional thing thinking about transactions to more relating and they have the ing word um, and uh, sorry we want to move from transactions to relationships and then relationships to relating and um, we came up with the idea that um, essentially there are uh, two ways of relating and this is a bit of a critique of uh, Patricia Clarkson's five relationship model where we essentially said we relate from the present or from the past and when we put that together with another person, we have four possibilities. We're either relating together in the present or one of us is in the past. You know, people would say usually the client, you know, that we're in the present and the client is stuck in the past. But we also wanted to allow for the possibility of those moments where we slip into the past and the, and the client's in the present. <laughs> and then, of course, both of us can be stuck in the past. And so we had this idea of simplifying that sort of five relationship model to a much more transactional relating model where we move from one area to another and that either the therapist or the client can can make uh, if you like a cross transaction to bring people into the present so you'll see as i go through co-creative ta some of this is actually going back to fun some of the fundamentals of ta in terms of the focus on transactions and relating and also another um, thing that I think was one of Burns major contributions was simplicity, trying to simplify things rather than getting too complex. Um, so that's, um, that's been quite an important aspect of co-creative too. Um, in terms of ego states, um, we, this is a quote from the original article. We question the notion that the adult ego state is the basis for objective processing. 
and suggest that um, the ego state model may be used as, as ways of describing different kinds of subjective experience that the old sort of parent adult child with the ad particularly when the adult is sort of reduced to a computer program um, seems very, very reductionistic um, and we also move away from the structural metaphor in which the ego state has been cast and so what we came up with um, and this was particularly my contribution which um, I took forward was this idea on the um, right of the sort of a moving ego state the, so the integrating adult um, compared with the so oh, there, there's the integrating adult pulsing away there we go where is it it just moved <laughs> I like that um, and so we go back to the idea of the sort of neo psyche the integrating adult uh, which is a bit different from Erskine's integrated adult and then the uh, extra psyche is the interjected parent ego states the unresolved interjected parent ego states and the archaeo psyche is the archaic child ego states so essentially the difference between the traditional model and there's lots of different models within that traditional model and our model is that the traditional model is a three ego state model of personality and a three ego state model of health the traditional models propose growing the parent adult and child hence the idea of inner child work inner child work by definition is based on the idea of growing the child and this is an argument i used to have with claude steiner who was a you know a good friend of mine but he would always say oh i'm having so much fun i'm in my child and i'd say i'm having so much fun i'm in my integrating adult because in our model it's a still a three ego state model of personality but it's a one ego state model of health so it's the integrating adult ego state is, if you like, where it's at, whereas the uh, interjected parent ego states, the idea is to integrate them and to have no interjections left. And the idea of the archaic child is to have, is to integrate all of those aspects of the archaic child that we want to integrate and have no unresolved fixated parts. Now, of course, that's an ideal, it's unrealistic, but the idea is is to integrate everything into the integrating adult ego state and hence that that difference between say Claude and myself and so when he says I'm happy I'm in my child he's using a traditional model of ego states where you're seeing the child as a positive ego state and you want to grow it whereas I I'm saying I'm happy I'm excited I'm you know uh, happy to be talking with you I'm in my integrating adult because I see it's a different sort of epistemology if you like it's based on a different idea of of health so obviously uh, and where we get these ideas from is burn we're not making this up we we have a different reading of burn 61 uh, his book in uh, transaction analysis uh, in psychotherapy if the adult is characterized by an, an autonomous set of feelings attitudes and behavior patterns which are adapted to the current reality then then a person according to james and jungle ward could be born adult because their behavior their what they're doing is consistent um and i've taken that one step logically further back and say that actually then we're conceived adult So that's the summary. So, um, as I say, rush, you know, not, uh, I'm, don't know if I'm rushing through, but I'm, I'm presenting it in fairly um, swiftly to maximize discussion. So this is a traditional script matrix um, from Steiner 66. Uh, we have some issues with that we were critical of that along the same lines that um, uh, people like Bill uh, Finita English and Bill Cornell were challenging traditional linear stage theories um, and we also agreed with Bill Cornell that the script theory doesn't account for temperament um, and that scripts are co-created so infants we know from developmental psychology that inf infants influence the mother, for instance, to turn towards them. 
and to there's a sense of co-regulation rather than one-way regulation. Um, so we argued that injunctions, programs, drivers, etc., are equally co-created, and that the decision is co-created. Also, the traditional script matrix um, is very cultural. It's very heteronormative. It doesn't account for uh, different relationships between, you know, a, a child and two mothers, for instance. Um, and that we think we can have several stories running, not just a gendered story, um, but also a story based on, you know, race or sexuality or whatever. So we came up with um, parallel script matrix, um, parallel vectors. Um, and so you have the subject and you still, you still have the male female in this case, uh, because I think even with two mothers, you still, we still live in um, society where the gender is fairly obvious. So the male influences might be a teacher or a grandparent or whatever, and you still have and the female influences. But beyond that, because of the Oh, I haven't actually got, I haven't got a picture of this. Beyond this, we also have these different narratives. So it might be, we have a script helix where you might have one dynamic of male, female, but another dynamic about race, black, white, uh, or colored and white, or, or in terms of sexuality, gay, straight. So in a sense, we're saying, we're again bringing this idea of sort of a meta narrative to the idea of script theory. And finally, in terms of games, which we call, we've called, we've renamed these, you've seen that as I've gone through, you know, co-creative identity, co-creative um, uh, personality and so on. Psychological games we call co-creative confirmations. They either confirm things or not. Um, and we also reclaim the idea, just as we reclaim the idea of a healthy script, which is from Bill Cornell and so on, and also, um, Richard Erskine talks about that. We talk about a game as not always being negative. And again, we go back to Byrne and say, if you, if you agree with that definition, it's actually a neutral definition. You could have an ongoing series of complementary ulterior tra transactions progressing to a positive outcome, you know, like a, a, a positive relationship. So we reclaim the idea of positive games, which again, Byrne talked about, but in a very short chapter in, in Games People Play. So games and playing games are neutral, not necessary, not always pathological. Yep. I'll pause again there because I think I've, I've, given, I've thrown a lot at you. I mean, I can talk a little bit about the book and the history of the book, but I think probably that's enough to be going on with. So um, I'd like to open it up actually for some reflections, discussions, questions, disagreements. <laughs> Keith, I have a question. Uh, going back to uh, the distinction between integrating adult and three ego state model. Yeah. So I'm with you as far as um, saying in in words what the the difference is, but in terms of its application or. Um, the change experienced by the client, mm. how does that actually manifest? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you a sort of two minute version of an article that I wrote about um, uh, co-creative empathy, which came out in 2011. So essentially what I'm doing, if I'm working, as I'm working from the integrating adult model, my transactions are aimed at the client's integrating adult. And I think that the change takes place. So this is essentially the empathic. So I'm trying to be, attempting to be as empathic as I can no, no. and to, and to um, be uh, uh, expanding the client's integrating adult or helping them expand their adult. And if what I believe happens is that some change takes place in that as a result of that and the co-creation of a therapeutic environment, they integrate archaic previously stuck parts. So archaic child or int interjected parent 
so they might have a sort of aha moment or feel that they can take some permission from me or whatever and that they so diagrammatically i see that as them going down into the child or going up into the parent and and almost re-digesting something that they've previously not been able to digest and so the power is in the patient uh, not not in the therapist or the power is actually in the relationship now uh, that's different from say Hargaden and Sills who have this idea of the empathic transaction going from the adult to the adult and a dotted an ulterior transaction going from the therapist's adult to the client's child but I don't do that it's more i see that if there's any dot if there's any ulterior it's 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 that the the client themselves is doing the therapy and i'm not trying to aim at, at anything so my focus is entirely on expand is helping the person expand the adult and and then give you an example an example is often when i do workshops um people say usually towards the end of the workshop they say you know we sort of checking out or reflecting on the workshop and people say oh was, that was really great I mean they don't always say it was really great but if they say that was really great um, one of the things that was great is is when you gave me that permission to think more for myself or to think critically or you know and, and I smile because I say that, that that's great and I'm glad you've got that but but I can tell you that I have not given you that permission I have not said it's okay to dot 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 because I just I just don't do that I've edited that from my repertoire but what I do believe is that you've taken that permission so I think people people take from it so that's what it looks like in sort of therapy and I've also now just written a recent article about the three P's because I think permission has been very much constructed in TA from a one-person psychology from a sort of I'm the therapist I know what permission to give I give it and the person feels better Whereas I'd say it's more co-created and people take the permission they need. So I begin uh, to yeah. answer your question. <laughs> so currently the differences seem to be very subtle to me and um, mm. I'm quite a detail oriented person. So mm. uh, having that answered would, you know, having a, a very clear and distinct difference would make it easier for me. What I'm hearing so far is that um, in the three ego state model of um, practice, there's still almost um, some kind of symbiosis taking place. That's, I think which, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Which yeah. might be the, the practitioner giving the permission yeah. in, in your example, as opposed to um, the co-creative, uh, interdependent relationship but yeah. there's autonomy in that the client gives themselves the permission yeah yeah absolutely because the tradition in the traditional model of permission is diagrammed from the therapist parent to the client's child you know it's okay for you to mm. feel anxious to you know eat while we're having a seminar or whatever <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm still curious about uh, in your example, the fact that um, the client did experience, uh, even if it was only perceived by them, an mm. ulterior transaction that that you were yeah. the permission giver. Yeah. Well, I think this. I, see, I I agree that I think some of the differences are subtle, but I think philosophically they're quite big because I think they're, you know, one of the issues for me is the power in the. You know, I'm very sensitive to. Uh, the, the use and abuse of power and I think for a therapist to say it's okay actually creates as you say a symbiosis or a dependence because the next time I need that permission I have to go back to the therapist and hear that again you know I, and so there's a sort of it, you know, to me that's part of that sort of analysis to interminable whereas if the person only takes the permission when they can really feel it and experience it and so on that to me is more powerful and I think you're right that the, what's, in, what's curious about it is that people will almost swear that I've said it, you know, they'll say it was great when you said it was okay that I could think for myself. And I go, well, great that you've taken that. But, I, but what's really curious is that I can guarantee you if we tape this whole two days, I never said that. What I believe is that we co-create 
a therapeutic engagement environment, a permissive environment, if you like, in which you take that permission. So I think it, it's both um, perceiving at a, it's, it's, it's misperceiving in a way at a sort of social level, but I agree with you that it's perceiving something at an ulterior level, which, is, which I think is fascinating. But to me, it's very important that I work, um, if you like, subtly and gently and, um, you know, sort of hands off and uh, not taking that sort of power position that many therapists have done and some therapists still do. Thank you. And of course, I may be wrong. I mean, <laughs> or it may not suit you. You know, I, I, I'm not saying this is the right way. I think it's, it's our way, partly in response to some of the things, you know, we saw in our own training experience in our own therapy. Um, I'm struggling to find the shared responsibility in that example, because it almost feels to me like the client is the one who well, pretty much has all the responsibility there. Like if me as the coach is, remit, is coming from my integrating adults and speaking to their integrating adults, mm. then them choosing to integrate from their parent or their child while we're transacting is their responsibility. So yeah, I, I'm not really sure where the shared comes into that. I guess the shared, I think it's a great question, Kirsty, thank you, uh, because, um, and it probably speaks to the fact that I didn't spend much time on that, um, so it's great. Uh, I think for me the shared responsibility is that I will take um, responsibility, for instance, to be responsive, you know, to say, oh yeah, maybe I didn't explain that so well, you know, like I did just then, rather than say, oh well, I wonder, you know, what, what the issue of, what, you know, do you have an issue with responsibility? You know, which would be a sort of more one person psychology putting it back to you so i'm i'm always looking for my part in things you know what was um a client of mine um no, i probably won't share that in terms of this being public but i was just thinking about what my uh yeah so if people sort of say something to me about how they're feeling about something that i've done rather than immediately focusing back on them i will look for the if you like the grain of truth or the the bit well what's what's my part in and what's what's my part in the co-creation of what that person's saying so that's one bit i think also in terms of say coaching or whatever i i do pay attention to some of the context and the detail around that so you know a cultural welcome and so on that's part of what i co-create um mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't always go well. So my, my first client in, when I came to New Zealand, I um, uh, is a, a white Pakeha, a European um, background client. And I said, you know, put, put my hand out and shook and said, oh, kia ora, you know, which means hello, welcome. And I knew, and he, he went, oh, hello, and slightly flinched, slightly sort of held back. And I thought, uh, I, I think that was... A, a mistake in, in my desire to be sort of culturally setting the cultural ground I'd missed him because I, he's not he wasn't the sort of person who would take your so you know it, it's paying a de paying attention to that sort of detail of what the setup is and and so on and, and as I say I don't always get it right and, and sometimes that I'd, I'd now think about that as actually a rupture in the relationship rather than um, anything else mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're both taking responsibility, but it's responsibility of different things. The client yes. is there for their own healing. That's yeah. what they take responsibility yeah. for. Yeah. I'm there to offer my services, so I'm taking yeah. responsibility for the yeah. environment and the way in yeah. which I do that. Absolutely. Like when you were checking in, if I can say, um, if that's okay, about you know not having a room, and clearly you've got an idea about what sort of room you want and is suitable for your clients or your or your coaches you know whatever so that's the sort of responsibility to me that it's paying attention that you know how we are how we how we dress how we address those sort of things yeah mm, yeah so yeah yeah cool thank you keith i've got another question um it's about working in the here and now 
And my experience is that only sometimes does the, the client's script play out in the actual engagement with me in a session. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously it's, it's happening all the time, but usually they're talking about circumstances which they want to apply the learning from the session to. Mm. So I, I was just wondering about how you identify or detect that the client is not in the here and now if they're talking about uh, challenges that they're experiencing, experiencing in their circumstances outside of a session. Hmm. Again, it's a great question. I, I, I tend to, um, I, I'm probably more tolerant of people talking about things outside the session in the session. <laughs> so, um, I was struck by how much you were doing the, the welcoming and as we were gathering and you were, you know, saying, bringing people in and making connection, if you like, a bit of ritual, a bit of pastiming, a bit of, you know, make, but making connection. And there was something to me about, you know, people, people talking about, um, you know, the land is somebody, you know, Sharon saying the land is smiling. That to me, it really resonated. You know, it, it may have been a, a casual remark or about the rain and the freshness of the rain and so on but to me that's it's all it's all part of the picture so and and even when people talk about you know a friend of mine said or a friend of mine's dealing with this or that I'm probably more tolerant of hearing trying to hear the whole story and bring bring all of who that person is into the session and not necessarily seeing it as a distraction or an avoidance so that's one feat, that's one aspect of it. Um, but the other is, I think that I'm um, hopefully after 30 years in the business, reasonably alert to sort of um, the subtle cross transactions or s subtle ways where the person might discount something present, you know, or change the language. Say if I use present language, they might use past language, those sort of things. And I, you know, I will, I'll challenge that um, uh, or I might comment on it. Um, you know, gently, uh, but I, I think, um, yeah, I suppose that's, that's in terms of what I'm thinking about, essentially working with the transactions and that's, that's old style. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, you're co-creative, it's all very new. I think in many ways I'm classical, you know, in terms of TA, because I always go back to burn. And I agree with uh, Claude Steiner when he said, you know, transaction analysis is about the analysis of transactions. So, in a sense, that's what I do uh, with the added nuance, if you like, of uh, being willing to be in the transacting as well as analysing. So not analysing your transactions, but saying what's going on between us. Mm. And, and you also using present examples. So I'll use stuff in the room, like as I've done a little bit reflecting on things, information that I have from the last 50 minutes, you know. And, and I guess this, the other part of an answer might be, and it's, it, we go into it in more detail in the book, um, is that I think that the past, I've been very influenced by Daniel Stern's book about, the, uh, uh, well, Daniel Stern's work full stop, but particularly his book called The Present Moment. So I'm interested in absolutely the present moment. So I don't, I'm not a great one for sort of digging around in the past or saying, well, what, what is that script and how did you replay it in the past and so on? Because I believe, I, I know that the past is in the present, in, in those moments of rupture particularly, or getting it wrong or misattuning or whatever. Ah, so we've got, here we've got the past in the present. There's a lovely passage where uh, Graham challenges me in the book about, I say, oh, I don't like digging around in the past. You know, the unconscious will come and bite you on the bum or something. And so he, he challenges me a little bit about, about that. But I do think that there's a bit too much digging around in the past and, and I'm more of a sort of present-centered sort of guy. I, I, at best. <laughs> Some of my family might not think that. But. I was thinking yesterday about the, the name of, of our framework, Transactional Analysis, and mm about how there's almost like a disconnect from the client because it's an analysis 
of the transactions as opposed to yes. being immersed and connect Im immersed in whatever's happening and connected yes. um, and thinking you know just playing around with words in my head yeah. and came up yes. with a, a transformational analysis yes or something like that yeah and with, uh, with, i think graham has talked about transactional design a week mm, yeah transactional design yeah yeah, it's, it's a very interesting because I'm writing a, a book and a book on TA, another book on TA, um, and I'm play, I'm looking at uh, a transaction analysis using the Martha Stark framework and with my own edition, and actually seeing the word, the phrase transaction analysis as a very one-person psychology. It's very much you know here I am and analysing your transactions, and I think we do need yeah we do need to play with different words. Um, but then, you know, I probably like that sort of playfulness with words and phrases. I, I, but because I think words and words mean things, you know, and, and they change that, what I said earlier about how, how we construct ourselves and how we construct the world. So, so playing with what suits you maybe to change and talk about transactional design. Mm -hmm. I know when we first used that phrase, some of the educationists, TA educationists got very excited about the idea of transactional design. So I was wondering, you talked about those moments of rupture, and I'm wondering um, how else one could work with stuff that's in the present uh, other than that, because otherwise one is talking about external circumstances or the past, maybe the future. I'm not sure I quite understand the... So yeah. you talked about those moments of rupture, like yeah. um, something goes on between the, the practitioner and the client. Yeah. And and to me, that's the only way that one can work with stuff in the present. Yeah. So, for instance, so I might I, say, am I right in, in understanding yeah. that meaning yeah. from you? Yes, absolutely. So, for instance, I might say, um, "Oh, I didn't. I, you know, just then I didn't quite understand what you meant, and." You know, how, so how, how was that moment for you 30 seconds ago when I didn't understand what you meant? And it, that might lead to a whole thing mm. you know, that, that you have about not being understood or, you know, mm. not being mm. understood by men or whatever. I don't know. But it's like paying that that was a moment between us. And I don't know what it meant for you. I don't know what it meant for me. You know, maybe it probably, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm probably a little bit tired or I didn't quite hear or something. Yeah, so that's the sort of way that I might focus on the present because that's happened between you and I not more than a few seconds ago. That's a great example. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm aware of time and I'm just thinking, I'm just wondering, I'll sort of look at my own notes and see if there's anything I particularly, I mean, you'll have the slides afterwards. I don't think... Um, there's much I want to say about the book actually the books that the rest of the slides are really just saying what's in the book so um, uh, and a few pictures of the original book launch I, I suppose what I, one of the things I want to say about the um, about the book was that um, since since the original article so I'll just give you a little bit of context to sort of finish with since the original article I then went off and wrote a book on uh, wrote a chapter on ego states and then uh, I wrote an article on empathy and Graham wrote something and I was wanting to sort of collect the sort of people saying well what is the co-creative TA you know what's the literature so I said well I think there's four articles that I was just going to put out a sort of almost a leaflet or a booklet about it and Graham said no why don't we use the opportunity to reflect on what we've done and have a dialogue so the book itself is a is a dialogue between uh, between us um, and so we have a chapter for instance that he wrote and then I comment on the chapter and then he comments back on my comments and so on it goes and we because we're quite robust with each other we disagree so there's lots of where we say I disagree with that or I think you're saying making you're not uh, paying enough attention to the unconscious or whatever and then we gave all of that to five colleagues to then reflect on that as well um, so we uh, one of the, the best 
bits of feedback we I've had about the book or we've had about the book is that it's quite lively and it sort of invites people in to the dialogue which is exactly what we wanted it to do so I, I'm very much um, you know I hopefully indicated that this is a work in progress and we want other people to take it forward we're not saying we've got the last word we're not saying it's a, a new school of TA it's a re-reading of TA um, which is very much based on our own you know biographies and experiences and so on and it's for you know for other people to take it forward if they find it useful so I hope that the next book on co-creative TA will be written by other people um, and that looks like it might happen, which is which is a great uh, stroke. Wonderful. So, sorry, just before you close your your slides, would you mind going back to the slides with the four pillars: the present I, present you. Oh yeah. That one. I just missed a word that I, I was jotting down and I missed a word and it might not make sense because I'm missing that word. Yeah, the four pillars I'm referring to are um, transactions, ego, states, scripts and games. Thank you. Yeah, but those, that's the slide with the four, um, the four ways of, of relating. Yeah. Because essentially we were critical of Clarkson's five relationship model because uh, we thought that the developmentally needed was part of the transferential that the I thou and the working alliance were more or less the same thing and the transpersonal wasn't a relationship all of which is terribly controversial but uh, for some people but for us it was quite important to sort of go back to basics and simplify things and that's very Bernian you know that idea of trying to simplify complex ideas so you know a model where there's two 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 ways of relating is to me more satisfactory than a model of five therapeutic relationships which aren't comparing like with like yeah i'm not really following the um like partial transferential like all of that but i i do very much like the simple Present time, yeah. past you, yeah. past time, yeah. past you. Yeah, that makes. I sense mean, the, the the partiality is recognizing that um, we, you know, I don't think we're ever out quite out of the present. It's the sort of sense of we're we're having a a partial transferential. You know, does if we slip into the past and we project on to somebody, we adapt. We, we are still in the present, but we're transacting from the past. So this is the idea of a sort of partial transferential. Mm -hmm. transaction uh, which can go either way you know I can project onto a client as much as one well, hopefully not as much but um, as they project onto me thanks you're welcome I really appreciated your questions they're very uh, enlivening thank you Um, Keith, I'd just like to ask you around this particular diagram, mm. the relevance of the arrows. Are you saying that you move from the one to the next to the next or that yeah. we move backwards and forwards from one state to the other? Is that what that what it's about? Yes, uh, the, 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 the importance. Yes, it, the sense of if we, you know, that we might be going, we might be sort of transacting as I hope we are now adult to adult and then something might happen to either of us where we go into some sort of past state okay you know your your accent might remind me of a previous therapist who was nasty or you know whatever and then I go oh and then I I get a bit short with you or whatever actually I I have very fond associations with South African accents I should say because my some of my therapists have been South African um uh, and they've been good. So uh, it's that idea that we might just momentarily, you know, go out of contact or for a long period of time, but that both of us are capable of pulling out of that. Right. So, so it's, we're sort of equalizing the power between the therapist and, and the client and saying that you might go from one to the other or you might go all the way around or back. Yeah. 
So instead of coming from um, the um, OK Corral, where it's I'm OK, you're OK, etc., um, you're looking here more in terms of, you know, are we relating adult to adult or are we in a transferential relationship? Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you pick up, for example, that you're in a partial transferential relationship at this moment, hmm. how would you then um, action that in the therapeutic session? W would you then go, go into your own adult um, in order to connect with the integrating adult of the client? Is, is, is that, what, is that yeah. how you would go about using yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it. But, but and the statement, because I think you've answered it for me. Um, yes, I tend to cross the client's part, but I will tend to cut across it because I'm. Um, after, if you like, animal therapy, it, to me it seems very therapist-centered to say to have this blank screen where you foster the transferential relationship. We, I don't, and that's the thing. I don't need to foster. It, I don't need to dig around in the past or dig around in the unconscious because it will be in the present. So I will, you know, I do work as I think we all do with with transference, and we do outside the therapy session as much as inside the therapy session. Um, colleagues and friends and family and politicians and all sorts of things um but i yes i you're right in catching the sort of logic of what i'm saying is that i will tend to be you know, so i might observe i might reflect on it i might speculate i might offer a uh, pathic um uh, response yeah. i might offer something of my own response you know say oh i you know I, that, I felt that was hurtful what you said or something like that you know Sometimes I might even apologize. If I get something wrong, I might say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I missed you. And sometimes the fact that I've apologized has been enormously reparative and I didn't even know it. And that to me is also the beauty about the power being in the patient because, and that's why I don't give permissions because I don't know what's going to be impactful until, until we have an, a present centered moment that we then unpack. Mm. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Keith, I don't want to let you go. Um, I have oh, one no. more question. <laughs> go on. Um, you, you talk about, a lot about um, empathic transactions. And um, I think TA can be quite a cognitive exercise, mm. um, especially when we're talking about the theory. So my question is, how do you... Uh, do being empathic with clients? Well, I think that is a hard question because I probably, if this were a workshop, this is the stage where I'd say, okay, we've had an hour's conversation. Now I'll do a demonstration and then you'll see it, see it in action. And, um, uh, and then we can, we can um, debrief it. And I think that's a good way to go. Maybe that's a good way for us to go in terms of another, another session um i guess you might have seen it that i think uh, i was being no i don't think i was being playful but I, I i think in that reflection with you i i might have picked something up and we might have explored that and that might be a way to go with empathy you know so it's just having that a, 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 you know attention and attunement if you like um but i think what you'd see and what people see is me uh, and the feedback i get is paying detailed attention to the present uh, being quite slow, being quite and, and being respectful, and, and those sort of things. Hmm. Um, but I think it's difficult to describe. It's probably easier to see it and then comment. But and I'd be, I'd be up for doing that at a, another time. Um, hmm. It's, a, it's very inviting. Work. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe what what I'm two. struggling to see is the difference between observation and empathy. No, I think with, for me, it's more about being in it rather than rather than in the sensing I'm observing you, you know, your skin tone changing. Um, and what does that mean that I would be 
you know, I might, I might just pause or I might, I'm, I'm, my eyes might, you know, I might be a bit moist or, you know, I might, and often um, the feedback I get is uh, my gestures are often mod paralleling what the client's doing. Um, I remember I did a demonstration in when I was in Europe doing a bit of a tour and there was a lot of movement to the chairs and we spent about, you know, feel, felt like five minutes, it was probably only 30 seconds, but sort of just adjusting our chairs and getting the right space between us and so on. And that was, the ther that became the therapy about like that distance and whether the chairs were ships that passed in the night or not and those sort of things. So, yeah. Yeah, like you, I feel a bit torn. I'd love to stay, but I also have a um, a, a beer date with my son, so I I'm not going to. <laughs> I do need, I do need to close. Um, uh, that's a rare opportunity because he's 25 and he's told, oh, "Do you fancy a beer?" And I said yes, but it, you know, have to be after the seminar. <laughs> but I do have a uh, another engagement. Thank you so much for your time. I've, I've really enjoyed it and, and learned so much. Mm, great. Well, me to me, I've really enjoyed it and uh, I hope it's given you a taste of co-creative TA and, and I would be up for doing another one. And, and I, I like the, uh, the provocation in a good way, uh, the calling forth um, to perhaps demonstrate something and then we could, um, you know, go into some sort of, well, you, you could basically share your, your thinking. So I think that'd be wonderful. We'll yeah. make that uh, part two or another another time. Great. Well, thank you for the taster. You're very welcome, and uh, <laughs> go well. It must be the beginning of your day, so um, have a enjoy enjoy your days. And uh, it's been lovely to make a connection with you as uh, fellow Southern Hemisphere colleagues, and um, and and with the you know the community that is uh, the South African TA Association. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Ten, 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 <laughs> Enjoy the beer. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.